Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first presentation in ABC Repronym course. My name is Nikhil Bhagwat, and I'll be talking about core concepts in machine learning. Uh, it's especially applicable to neurosciences and life sciences. Uh, in this presentation, first we'll start talking about the machine learning nomenclature and the buzzwords around machine learning. Then we'll describe the basics of the learning process involved in machine learning and explain some of the model design choices we have to go through uh, and the consequent performance trade-offs associated with those choices. And then I'll introduce model selection and validation frameworks. And lastly, we'll talk about some of the model performance metrics uh, commonly used in practice. But before we proceed, I wanted to start with a pop quiz. Given the current pandemic situation, I thought this would be an interesting question. So let's say we have a population with 1% COVID prevalence, and we train a simple machine learning model to identify COVID patients using their biometric data. So say a handful of variables uh, from their biometric data. We find out our model is 91% accurate, and we also calculate that it has sensitivity of 90% and specificity of 91%. And so the question is, what are my chances that I have COVID if my test is positive? And feel free to pause the video and uh, think about this if you like. Uh, it also has another associated question. Say, instead of a simple biometry model, we now train a fancy deep learning model to identify COVID patients using their chase city. Now we find out that this has much improved accuracy of 99%. Uh, we also calculate specificity of 99% and sensitivity of 80%. So the question is, which one is better? Again, feel free to pause the video and uh, I'll get to the answers later in the presentation. The reason I wanted to start with this pop quiz is to basically uh, give you a test of whatever questions we have to answer as machine learning practitioners as we go along. Uh, and it has, I came to realize this uh, lately that the actual part of machine learning of model training, uh, which is the first step in uh, developing a model, uh, machine learning model, is actually quite easy. The harder part is making all the decisions. So for example, which features to use as your input, which models to pick, sometimes you have thousands of models to pick from, and which performance metrics make sense in your uh, practical uh, case or in your research. And usually all of this is encapsulated in a validation framework. And so we have to understand how to use the validation framework to ensure our model actually works in practice and it's generalizable beyond your just one data set. So we'll go through all of this one by one, uh, but let's first begin with the basics. So what is machine learning? Uh, so machine learning is essentially a computer algorithm that improves automatically using data and lots of lots of data usually. Machine learning is a subset of a broader term of artificial intelligence, a broader concept of artificial intelligence, uh, and neural nets are actually a subset of machine learning and deep learning is even a subset of neural nets. So that's the hierarchy uh, of all of these terms. Uh, so in life sciences or neuroscience especially, uh, we have started using machine learning a lot, mostly because we are usually presented with a lot of, lot of, lot of variables, made in neuroimaging data or genetic data. It's very difficult to make sense of all these variables uh, without some computational or algorithmic help. Uh, so machine learning can really help, under help us understand complex relationship between these variables and mostly to make accurate predictions. So they are very good at that. But they only work uh, if you have a, a well-defined prediction task or if you're just interested into low dimensional representation. So the first prediction task usually falls in a supervised learning category, whereas the low dimensional representation falls into unsupervised learning uh, category. And of course, all of this only works uh, if you have a lot of, lot of data. So the terminology is actually quite simple. Uh, uh, you have an input that is usually arranged in a number of samples by number of features as a, as a tabular format. A uh, number of samples can be the individuals you're collecting data from, and number of features or the features uh, which are represented in rows can uh, be like brain volumes for each individual or genetic information from each individual. And the outcome can be a binary, okay, is it the disease or healthy or disease, or it can be something more 
continuous variable as a symptom severity and so on. And the goal is to basically build a model or train a model that will take this input, uh, usually very complicated input, and make the predictions as accurately as possible. Given the number of uh, large number of algorithms within the machine learning umbrella, I think it helps to think of them in this two by two rubric. So I already talked about the uh, supervised and unsupervised learning procedures, uh, but there you can also divide them using if the outcome variable is continuous or categorical. In supervised learning, that translates into a regression problem if you have a continuous outcome and a classification problem if you have a categorical variable. Of course, you have uh, counterparts to that in unsupervised learning as well. Uh, but in this presentation, we will mostly focus on supervised learning and the subsequent lectures will talk more about unsupervised learning. Okay, so the supervised learning, uh, the goal is to learn parameters, also known as weights or sometimes coefficients of model uh, that maps X to Y. And there are different families of models commonly used uh, is a linear regression or logistic regression for classification of super vector machines, which are hugely popular a decade ago. There are tree ensembles, which work really well if you have very heterogeneous data. And there's, of course, artificial neural networks or deep learning models that have become extremely popular for computer vision and natural language processing tasks uh, lately. So, how do we all these models actually get uh, learn the, these relationships? Uh, they, so they go through something called model fitting, and it's it's somewhat easier to explain this and visualize this in the context of linear regression model. So I'll stick to that. But the same concept applies to all the other models as well. So say we have a linear regression model uh, which basically predicts the outcome variable y by a linear combination of variables, say x1 and x2 or sometimes just x1 if you just have a single line. Um, so it basically comes with three or uh, coefficients or model parameters in this case is beta zero, beta one and beta two. And the goal is to basically come up with these uh, or estimate these beta parameters so that for the input we have, we produce the most accurate output. And the process to do that is usually gradient descent. So the way it works uh, in, a much, in a simpler case is uh, say you have started with random weights and here I'm showing you just a one input example. We just have X1. So you only have to estimate beta zero and beta one. And you start with the random weights, you estimate the loss, uh, which is essentially an error between the prediction and the actual value of Y. And based on that loss and the gradient of your loss function, uh, which is uh, essentially a derivative of your loss function, you can update the weights in the direction where your loss gets reduced in the next iteration. So if you keep doing this uh, until the algorithm converges, you basically find uh, this set of weights, in this case, beta zero and beta one, that produce the least amount of error and most accurate, uh, accurate predictions on your training data. Of course, uh, not here you can see the, this basic loss function has only one local, uh, global minimum, but that may not be the case all the time. For more complex models or more complex loss functions, you may have a bunch of local minimum and a bunch of global minimum or minima, and you need more sophisticated alg algorithms to avoid getting stuck in the local minimum. But the idea of updating weights stays the same. Okay. So now the question is, can we control this fitting process uh, to get a model with specific characteristics or is it something that we just have to uh, let, the, let the algorithm control the whole way? And the reason I'm asking this question because sometimes we know more about the model uh, or what type of model is plausible based on our prior beliefs. Uh, the prior beliefs can come from a literature search or just your expertise. So for example, you, you may want a model uh, that is not too complex uh, or even you, because you know, because only a handful of variables can do the prediction uh, correctly. Uh, so it could be like a handful of genes that are predictive of certain symptoms, uh, or it could be just because of practical reasons where you know you don't have enough data. So having overly complex model it's uh, not going to generalize well. And I'll talk about that more in, late, uh, in later slides as well. 
but the way then what you want is you want to force many of these uh, input variables uh, to be non-active. And the way to do that is basically have a bunch of these uh, model parameters or the betas to be zero. And the process to do that is called model regularization. And what it essentially does, it's uh, basically forces, uh, depending on the regularization, uh, certain types of uh, uh, characteristics on these weights. So the two commonly used regularization techniques are called L1 lasso, which constrains the parameters to be sparse. So if you want only a handful of non-zero input variables uh, contributing to your prediction, you can use lasso. Or if you want your parameters to be just very small, you can use something called a ridge regression, and that will basically uh, add, that, that will basically force your model parameters to be small. And the way this is done is by simply adding this additional term shown in orange for lasso and purple uh, or bluish purple for rich. And by just simply adding say absolute, uh, absolute values of your moral parameters, uh, it changes your loss function. And as a consequence, uh, your moral learns parameters which are only, only handful of them are uh, non-zero. And in the rich cases, you just add the squared uh, value of your parameters, uh, and that will help the model learn, learn uh, model parameters that are very small uh, at the end. Again, uh, the details of this is not important. I just want you to get the idea that there is a way to control what type of model you want to learn by adding these priors into your training process. Okay. I just want to show you a simple syntax. Like I said before, model training is a very easy part of this whole endeavor. Uh, so here I'm showing some code snippet where you just basically import some of the models from the scikit-learn library in Python. You get some data uh, and then you basically pick a model. In this case, I have picked a linear model with lasso regularization, uh, where I could easily pick some vector machines. And using this model, then I can gonna basically fit to this data by calling a method called dot fit, and that will fit the model to this data. And if now if I have new data, I can use this fitted model uh, to predict it on the new sample. In this case, just this would new one sample. Now, like I said, this is a very easy part. The hard part is to know how 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 to evaluate the performance of this model or how well this model will perform on on the different types of data sets. So the first question you want to ask is why am I model generalizable? And what I mean by generalizability is, is that, okay, training model will always work in terms of you'll get some model that is trained, but that is not a true measure of model performance. So what you want to do is basically uh, test that model on an unseen held out data set. And the way we do this usually is you take data samples. Say if you have 100 samples, you divide them into two sets, train and test. You use say 90% of them to train your model or model fitting. And once you have a fitted model, uh, you use the test set, which has not been seen by the model yet, uh, to evaluate if model has learned something that generalizes to the test set. And if it does generalize to the test set, then you, you'll see very similar performance on your train and test set. Uh, but usually that's not the case. Uh, so train performance usually doesn't equal test performance. Uh, and there are two re different reasons for this. Uh, if one uh, particular reason is, okay, you have picked a very simple model, that model is not able to understand or dis fit the data that you have properly. And that what results is into underfitting. So example here on the show is on the uh, bottom left, where my data has some curvature to it, whereas I'm fitting a straight line through that model, uh, through that data. And obviously that model will be highly underfitted. I'll produce a lot of bias when I'm doing prediction and it will give me poor performance. The other end of this is when I pick a model that is highly flexible or highly complex. So it's shown on the right and it will fit my training data really well. So it will basically go through every single point but this model is overly complex, almost seems uh, it's not pl plausible that real life will have something like this. And that's probably true because when we see a test data, both of these underfitting and overfitting models show you'll produce a lot of errors. 
Uh, the underfitting model will produce a lot of errors in terms of bias, and the overfitting will produce errors because of a lot of variance. Uh, so what you really want is basically an optimal model that is somewhere in the between. And typically, it's not easy to find the best or most optimal model, but you can always check your performance on your test data set and see if your model is overfitting. So if your test performance is very low, whereas your trend performance is very high, it's a clear sign that your, more, your model is just overfitting to your training data. Again, the same concept applies to classification example. Here I'm trying to separate two classes, uh, but my boundary in the, my underfitting case is a straight line. Uh, and in my overfitting case, it's a very jagged or zigzag line. And both of these cases are probably uh, most likely will produce bad test performance because the true pattern here is uh, somewhat a uh, curved line, smooth curved line between the classes. And our goal is to basically uh, fit a model or train a model that will be something close to this. Okay, so I talked about okay, the importance of evaluating your model on a test set. But how do we even pick the, this test set to begin with? So why this 10% samples or why this 90% in the train set? We could have been easily lucky or easily unlucky to get a really good test set or really bad test set. And so every time, as a rule of thumb, you have a arbitrary decision to make. It's better to make that decision, I mean, repeat that process multiple times. And that's exactly what we do uh, in, in the form of cross-validation. So the idea here is not to just pick one train and test set split, but instead of pick multiple train and test set splits. The way we do this is basically we divide our data into different folds. So here I've shown five folds. So if you have 100 subjects, you can basically divide 20 in each fold. And then we pick each fold as our test set in a, in a different round of uh, train and test splits. So in the first round, I will just take the first 90% of data, train the model, evaluate on this test set, and I'll take the second split where I've taken the first 60 and the last 20 as my train set, and I'm evaluating the test set in the middle, and so on and so forth. And what this will give me is instead of just giving one point estimate of my test performance, it will actually show me a distribution of my test performance, and which is a much better way of uh, evaluating your model because it gives you a mean and a standard deviation of your performance. Uh, but so far I've only said, okay, we have a model and we can test, use a cross-validation process to test, uh, basically evaluate its performance on the test set. But how do we get this model in the first place? And that's where we come into this uh, nested or the inner loop of this cross-validation. And the one thing to remember here is selecting a model, uh, it's something you have to do only on the trained data. Because in practice, you never have access to test data. So whatever model development or training you're doing or any choices you're making related to model need to happen only in the context of the trained data. So what do we do? Uh, again, we split that our trained data into folds. Here I'm showing the four folds. We use the first three folds to train uh, on different types of models. For example, I can use random forest, you can use linear regression, or I can even use linear regression with uh, say lasso as my regularizer or, or, or as my rich regularizer. So any type of model related choices I'm doing, I do them on my subset of this train set. And I evaluate the performance of each of my choice or if, if each version of my model on this validation data set. And again, I repeat this process and then I based on which version of the model performs well on all these validation, uh, well, validation splits or validation subsets, I pick that version of my model okay, as this, okay, I have developed this model now and then I'm ready to test it in the real world. Uh, so that brings us back to our outer loop where we test this, pick one selected model on our test data set. And again, this happens over and over again uh, in the outer loop. So we get a distribution of the test performance on this one selected model at the end. Uh, again, I'm going a bit fast on this uh, cross-validation uh, 
procedure, but we will talk about this again in the next lecture, but I just wanted to give you a sense of why are we doing this cross validation. Uh, the outer loop, we are doing cross validation because we want to get a distribution of our models performance on different test sets. And the inner cross validation we are doing or inner loop of the cross validation we are doing because we want to pick a good model uh, for the task at hand. And to pick a model, we can never use the test set. So we have to do another uh, cross validation procedure inside this in nested loop of our data. Uh, okay, so I briefly mentioned this hyperparameters of the model, but I never really defined them. So hyperparameters of a model uh, are not the parameters of the model. That's a basic thing. Parameters are always learned using the gradient descent method, uh, whereas hyperparameters are chosen. And there are different types of hyperparameters depending on the model, and each model has them. There are design parameters associated with the architecture of the model. So there are different kernels, uh, like there's a linear, polynomial, uh, radial basis, RBF kernel for superconductor machines. There are different number of trees, splits in terms of the ensemble models. And there are like a humongous amount of choices related to the neural networks in terms of the number of layers, filters, batch size, learning grid, and so on and so forth. So all of these choices pertain to the model's architecture. These we have to decide. And how do we decide them? Well, sometimes based on the prior beliefs. So we know something about the data and that can decide what type of kernel we want to use or what degree of model we want to use uh, to model the relationship between input and output. Many times we just pick arbitrarily, especially true for the neural networks uh, where we could have said something with something. And that's kind of what the whole uh, magical quality of neural networks comes into play because people just stumble upon good configurations sometimes. And of course, the last one, we can also do a trial and error, which is essentially what we talked about, uh, the inner nested inner loop of our cross validation, where we try out a bunch of different hyperparameters and pick the model with a certain hyperparameter configuration uh, that works great uh, in our inner loop. And then we use that model to evaluate its performance in the outer loop. Uh, but this can get computationally very difficult, uh, very computationally heavy, especially if you have a lot of hyperparameters, and that search can grow exponentially. Okay, so that brings us to our uh, last main topic, uh, which is the performance scores. And the thing I want to, uh, which you guys to note is, okay, the loss function that we use during the model fitting or training, uh, which is mean square error, for example. Uh, may not be well, well, may not be good interpretation or, uh, or well suited to explain that in uh, real, real practice. This is especially true for a categorical classification. So, in real, in real life, what we really want to know, in say, for example, in binary classification, is the true positives and true negatives, or sensitivity and specificity uh, type of things. And so when we train the model, even uh, the, we, at the end of the day, we have to uh, evaluate our performance in a variety of different metrics and not just the one we used uh, to train the model. Uh, so again, in the context of binary classification, uh, there are basically false positive, which is type one error, if you're from classical statistics and false negative, which is type two error. And depending on, uh, your task or what the problem you're trying to solve, one of, one of these type of errors might be more important than the other. And let me show an example of that. Okay, so yeah, this is basically a clue or the, it goes back to the initial questions or pop quiz I asked before. Uh, so we have a machine learning model that did COVID from Chase cities with a prevalence of 1%. Uh, so false positive will translate as model predicts COVID when person is healthy and false negative will uh, basically, model will predict healthy when person has COVID. So, what happens um, if you build a model that predicts everyone as healthy? Uh, so, there are basically no false positives because everybody is healthy. So, let's see what happens to all these metrics. So, say if you have 100 people, uh, since everybody is predicted uh, as healthy, we will be 99% correct. So, our accuracy is 99%. The sensitivity uh, that we talked before, 
uh, would be zero because the one person who has COVID or, or will not be detected as COVID. So, or anybody who has COVID will not come out as COVID because we are predicting everybody as healthy. And then specificity will be exactly one because we will be always correct about uh, healthy population, healthy samples. So the question is, is this a good model? And I hope uh, it's obvious to everybody that this is a terrible model because in this particular type of problem, we really, really care about sensitivity uh, because we don't want any false negatives. We don't want uh, COVID patients wandering around uh, because the test will not, wasn't able to detect them. So the false negative, uh, so that's why it's important to understand if even after a model is trained, how does, it, how does it fare with all these different types of performance scores? Uh, and if, if that makes sense for your practical use case. Okay, so now the answers that I promised before. Uh, so in the first case, uh, again, uh, it shows why it's important to understand uh, specificity and sensitivity or false positives and false negatives, because accuracy in itself, it's not a really good metric in most cases in applied machine learning. So for example, uh, the answer to the first question here was, okay, say it may, uh, if you have thousand individuals, given the one person prevalence, we have 10 COVID patients. And since my sensitivity is 90%, I'll detect nine of them. And since my specificity is 91%, I will detect almost 89 to 90 as my false positives. So the answer to the first question is actually one in 10. So if I get a if I get if I get a, a positive COVID test, it was it was kind of counterintuitive to me when I first uh, read about this as well, or when I had to first uh, do this problem. But it's really one in ten, even if my test is positive. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, then the second question again, we train this fancy deep learning model uh, to identify COVID patients using the chest CT, and the question was which one is better. Like I said, accuracy can be completely misleading in this case. We get 99% accuracy, but it doesn't really help because with 80% sensitivity, we will miss more uh, individuals uh, which have COVID. So in this particular case, we will still go with a simpler model uh, because our goal is to have very, very few false negatives. Okay, so the last portion, I'm just gonna give you some overview of the more recent advances in machine learning. And I believe uh, subsequent lectures will talk about this more in detail. But in, on a high level, uh, why, why people use deep learning? Uh, why there's so much buzz? Because I mean, it works amazing on certain types of data. So if you have very highly structured input, for example, uh, images which are have very strong spatial correlations, uh, and or the natural languages or speech uh, which have very strong temporal structure. Uh, these models work extremely well to learn that structure and make very very accurate predictions. But of course, they all come with their challenges. Uh, the challenges being they have huge number of parameters. I believe the latest uh, GPT, which is a language model, has over billions or maybe trillions of parameters. Uh, so to accurately estimate these parameters or fit the models, we need a lot of, lot of data. I think they use the entire corpus of Wikipedia sometimes. Uh, then you also have a lot of hyperparameters, like uh, larger the model gets, uh, you need to decide how many layers, what types of layers, uh, and these choices are also tricky to make and many times made arbitrarily, but the, it makes the whole training process much difficult and you require a huge amount of resources, uh, which can be environmentally problematic as well. But uh, in, in the context of medical or healthcare or neuroscience, uh, they can be extremely useful as well, especially in our research, we typically, we typically use them for segmentations of medical images and sometimes even diagnosis from uh, medical images or genetic data, because uh, they also have very strong spatial uh, uh, structure. Okay. Uh, so these are, I mean, we also have to be very aware of the pitfalls and challenges, especially when you're starting with machine learning. 
And as I said before, the, the main goal of machine learning practitioner is to have these models that are generalizable on test sets or different data sets. And some of the reasons that gets very difficult and you'll all have to deal with these challenges uh, is because of a few reasons. The first one uh, is called double, double tipping. And I brief, I, I think I, I briefly mentioned this about when I was talking about never to use test data set in uh, development of model, it's a similar concept. So if you ever use information from your test set during model development may it be as simple as just doing Z scoring uh, your entire data before splitting it into train and test sets, you are still using information from test set uh, to basically uh, train your models. Or if you're doing PCA on the entire data set before using it, before splitting it into train and test set. Because always remember in real life, you do not have access to test set. So that, that information is never present during model development. And so you should be never using it directly or indirectly. Then other common problems include uh, at the level of data sets. Uh, of course, each data set comes with its own biases. Uh, in my field, we usually use a lot of North American demographic data sets. So of course, when we train models on these data sets, they tend to not do so well on other populations from different parts of the world. So we need to be aware of these biases. And there are also issues with the ground truth or the labels themselves. So for instance, again, in my field, uh, the diagnosis definitions are not always clear, uh, especially things like autism, schizophrenia. Uh, so we have to be aware of the facts that, okay, your labels may change in future or maybe not be as uh, true as you hope them to be. And there are, of course, practical issues uh, that come into play all the time. Uh, for us, it's the data acquisition problems when we have different assays or different scanners over the years, the data distribution uh, definitely changes and it is likely to confuse the model uh, when that happens. Another thing uh, I want you to remember if you're starting uh, with the machine learning is there's often uh, this urge to start with a fancy model because it's a lot of, there's a lot of buzz or other people have used it uh, really well. In, uh, but it's always easy to, or it's always better to start with a simpler model and really think critically if you really need much complicated model, uh, then something simpler will suffice. Okay, so lastly, I think I'm gonna talk about this checklist. Uh, uh, which I wish I had <laughs> when I was starting uh, machine learning. Uh, some of them might seem trivial. For example, when you're dealing with data, always check uh, what is, or always be clear about what is your number of features and number of samples. I mean, this sounds silly, but it can get tricky very fast if you're using, say, dimension reduction or using data that has missing values. So they can get very tricky. Other thing is uh, you do decide if you're using categorical variables, how you're encoding them. Uh, I put a link in here, which shows you a much detailed explanation of that. But the basic idea is that you don't want your model to confuse categorical variables. If they're encoded as one, two, three, four, uh, they can be easily confused as a continuous or an ordinal variables by the model. So you don't want to, that to happen. And of course, I talked about this before, but it's always good to reiterate this fact about double dipping or using information from the test set uh, in a, your training uh, set. And uh, it's not always like you're mixing the same samples, but you're using say some information from the test set, even in pre-processing, uh, that is gonna cause a lot of problems uh, in terms of generalizability. And pertaining to the model, uh, it's always important to critically think about which performance metrics capture your practical use case. Uh, because your loss function will come from these matrix and the loss function will dictate what type of models you will learn. So it's important to think about this before you start model training. And of course, once you have trained model, uh, the comparing different models is actually rather a complicated subject, but you can always start with a very simple uh, sanity check, which is basically see if your model does better than a null or dummy models. Uh, in classification, that would be as simple as just, does my model do better than if I have a dummy model that predicts 
just the majority class all the time. And if I have a regression model that could be predicting the median value as my dummy model, and if my error from uh, the model that predicts median value is smaller than my, my model, then of course my model is doing really bad. And of course, the last thing we didn't really talk much about because uh, lack of time, but there is usually people is the risk of overinterpreting your model parameters or the learned weights. Uh, it's a very tricky issue, especially if your model is complex, complex and not linear. And in the beginning, I would strongly suggest to avoid doing it. Uh, like one thing I would reiterate again, these models are main to, meant to be good for prediction. Uh, their primary job is not to explain or build any causal relationship between your input and output. They are just there to predict, uh, predict your outcome with some computation. And so using these models to interpret or explain things can get very messy. Okay, I think that's my last slide. Uh, so in this pre presentation, I, like I said, I want you to remember this supervised learning models are useful for predictions. Uh, so if you have a good task that requires prediction, uh, image segmentation is a good one for that. Uh, some prognosis or development task can also be formulated as a prediction task. And all of these usually require little explanation. So it's good to focus on tasks that don't require too much explanation. You just need some computation done for in terms of segmentation. Uh, they're good candidates for doing supervised learning. Again, as a machine learning practitioner, especially in applied machine learning, uh, in, in life sciences, on your sciences, our job is to ensure generalizability of this model. A replication of this model on different data sets through multitude of validation is highly important. If your model does really well on your little data sets, it's not going to be useful in larger scheme of themes. Uh, and of course, every, there is no perfect model. Uh, so every model comes with biases and limitations uh, and we have to live with it and that's completely fine as long as you disclose and understand the biases and the limitations of your model and report them in your papers. And lastly, I want to leave you with some food of food for thought. Uh, in my experience, especially so far, we have used machine learning in life sciences or neurosciences as engineering tools. Like I said, we are doing some predictions and we are uh, making sure these tools work robustly. Uh, but uh, there are also uh, there are also areas of research in terms of using them as scientific discovery where these models will actually help us interpret and explain what's going on and maybe build uh, some uh, causal relationships between your input variables or features and your outcomes. But this is a very new uh, area of uh, research, uh, but feel free to explore that if you are interested. And uh, I hope all many of these concepts that we talked about today will come in handy in a more detailed, in-depth presentations on uh, additional topics of machine learning uh, in this recruitment course. And so thank you so much for your attention.